In this video, we're going to mesh a domain. And let me start with the definition of a mesh. So let's omega be included in RD, that will be our domain, the domain we want to mesh. A mesh of omega will be a decomposition of omega in subdomains. And this decomposition will have to meet two properties. The first one is that the elements do not overlap. And the second one is that they cover omega. Now, often we have to impose additional properties on this decomposition, on the mesh, some quality criteria. And often we also have to have some regularity on the domain omega itself. Now, let me give you an example, actually two examples, of a mesh. And let me start with a meshing a square here. Omega including an R2 is a square. And you can see that I can mesh it here with triangles. Now, when I said do not overlap earlier, uh, this is not a very precise definition. Actually, we will uh, give a precise definition in, in a few minutes. But by do not overlap, I mean you can basically like tile your bathroom. So it's, it's, we're not going to, obviously the, the, the elements can touch, they will touch, but we're not in a situation where two tiles are one on top of the other. So again, we're going to give a precise and mathematical definition uh, in, in a few minutes, but this is what we mean by do not overlap. So really think about uh, tiling the, the, the bathroom. Uh, another example here is in dimension one. You consider an interval and basically meshing the interval is simply considering a subdivision of this interval. Now, what I'm going to do is to uh, uh, investigate uh, what is a mesh in dimension one. Then I will do the same thing in dimension two and then I will actually generalize in higher dimension. So let's start with what's going on in dimension one. So omega is uh, going to be an interval a, B, uh, and just to, to simplify the notations, I will consider A to be equal to zero and B to be equal to one, but obviously what we're gonna do can be generalized to any A and B, with A smaller than B. Um, so a mesh of zero, one will be given by two things. First, J, which will be the number of inside nodes. And a second thing, which is basically that subdivision. So uh, a j plus two tuple, uh, x j going from zero to j plus one. So what we have is x zero will be zero, will be a, uh, the first end of the interval. Then I will have x one to x j, that will be the j inside nodes of my subdivision. And then I will have x j plus one, which will be the other end of the interval here, of course, one. Now, the step, or the discretization step, if you prefer, will be defined as the max of xj minus xj, I mean, xj plus 1 minus xj, obviously in absolute value, but if all of the xj's, uh, if all of the x's, the, the tuple is, um, is, is in order, then obviously it's simply xj plus 1 minus xj, and that will be the maximum distance, if you, if you want, between two nodes. Okay, so this is the definition of a mesh is basically a subdivision, and you probably heard about subdivisions of an interval before. Now, I can also consider a mesh that is uniform, and this means that the distance between two nodes is going to be a constant, then that constant will be called h, and obviously since I have j nodes inside, or if you prefer uh, j plus two nodes, uh, including the, 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 the two ends, then I will have exactly a step that will be one over j plus one, which means that any xj can be actually computed with this formula j times h. All right, well, that's actually pretty easy, and I, I believe you've already seen things like this before. When you talked about interpolation, for instance, uh, when you do interpolation, what you do is often consider a uniform mesh on zero one with a given step, h, and you use this mesh to interpolate the function. So here, to, to give an example, I have considered uh, the function x gives sine pi x, which obviously will vanish at both zero and one. And what I can do is, uh, well, I, I drew the, 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 the function u, and I also considered the value of this function 
at each node of my mesh, right? Uh, when I do this, then I can say, okay, I'm going to interpolate between two nodes by considering that I have a polynomial of degree, of, of, of degree one, basically a, a linear function. So when I do this, I can approximate my uh, function u by some of these segments here, some of these functions, of the, of the polynomials of, of degree one, and this is what I do when I do an interpolation. And I also presented to you to the to the right, actually further further here, uh, the, uh, the 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 what what is happening with the derivative. Okay, so this is what is going on when I have j equals four, so four inside nodes, six nodes all together. When I actually consider the ends of my interval, and h is one over five, zero point two. I can increase j. Uh, which means decreasing h, and here's what happens for j equals 8, and that means h equals 1 ninth. Uh, as you can see, uh, the interpolation will get closer, I mean, the, the, the error we're making will be smaller uh, with a higher j or smaller h, if you prefer. Uh, and you can keep going this way, here is what's going on for j equals 32. In other words, h equals 1 over 33. And actually, if I was to keep going this way, I could see that the error I'm making by replacing this u, which, which is the function sine pi x, uh, by the approximation of u using this um, interpolation based on the mesh, would actually, the, the error uh, will be, the uh, h10 error, Will be in log. I mean, will will be this, which which is a log scale uh, um, graph. Now, as you can see, actually consider the error in H one zero. I could consider the error in another norm, but uh, you know, H one zero is obviously quite an interesting norm because it takes into account the derivative and the function, thanks to Poincaré, as you know. Okay. Um, all right. So this is what we have for meshing a one D domain. And obviously, uh, it's something that you probably did before, maybe without knowing it, uh, but you did mesh uh, 1D domains. Now, let's see what is going on when we try to mesh a 2D domain. So, now I'm going to consider omega to be included in R2, uh, and that will be bounded, and I will consider the boundary to be a polygon. So, um, there will be several ways to mesh omega. Uh, and we will actually uh, discuss mainly uh, the mesh with triangles. I mean, I mentioned triangles before. There would be a possibility to mesh uh, the, the domain with other types of elements. Um, well, we could do quadrangles. I mean, there, there are several ways to do it. We will consider triangles in this course. So, uh, here is the definition of the triangulation of omega. Uh, it is basically a set T of triangles, uh, the elements, that will be called K1 to KJE, where J is the number of triangles. And what we're saying is that each triangle is obviously included in that domain omega, actually the closure of that domain omega. Uh, the domain omega will be uh, the union of the ki, so that means that they cover our domain, that the elements cover the domain. And the third thing we are requiring is the non-overlapping property, and we're going to give a precise definition of what we mean by they do not overlap. What we mean is that the intersection of two elements can either be empty, they can, uh, it can be a vertex, or it can be an edge. So again, it's like tiling the bathroom. Uh, the two tiles can be far away. I mean, they basically don't have any intersection. I mean, the intersection is empty, if you prefer. Um, the second possibility is that they will meet on a vertex, so they will just touch on one point. And the third possibility is that they will meet on an edge. So that's also a possibility. What we do not want is a situation when they will overlap in the sense that, uh, you know, when you tile your bathroom, all of a sudden one, one tile is on top of the other, that would be ugly in the bathroom and ugly when you do this, uh, when you mesh a 2D domain. All right, so uh, the vertices of the triangles T are called the nodes, and we'll see later that this is where uh, we're going to try to compute the function 
Um, in a sense, the reason why we're meshing is because we are going to compute the function at given point of this mesh, and this will be called the node. Okay, um, now in order to be uh, suitable, uh, the triangles will need to have some additional properties in some instances. So for instance, in, for some finite element uh, situations, you might want to require, uh, for instance, the, the, the triangles to, to be acute or to have all sorts of properties that might depend on the type of finite elements that you will consider. We'll talk about that later. Uh, we don't know what finite element method is right now, but what I'm saying is when you mesh, I gave you a general definition for a mesh, but sometimes you have to uh, require additional things uh, and, and, and impose additional properties. Okay, uh, now let me give you the definition of the, of the step of uh, the, 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 the mesh, and first let me define the diameter of the triangle K. Well, that will simply be the supremum of the distance of two points in the, in the triangle. So that's, uh, that's a pretty, pretty simple uh, definition. And the size of the mesh will be, or if you prefer the, 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 the step, will be the, max, the maximum of the diameters of all Ki's. Okay, now uh, let me um, introduce three uh, definitions here. The definition, the number JE that we already talked about earlier, that is the number of triangles, the number of elements uh, that we are going to consider. Now we're going to have JV, that will be the number of vertices, in other words, the number of nodes that we will have in with our triangles. And then we'll have JVD, that will be the number of vertices, the number of nodes, if you, if you prefer, that are not on the boundary. And as I said, uh, this will be where we're going to look for the solution, the value of the solution. So obviously, if you have a directly problem, for instance, uh, you will have JVD unknown, uh, because obviously you know you will know the value of your function of uh, you know, on the nodes that are on the boundary. Okay. Uh, let me give you an example here. Here's the domain. It's uh, not exactly polygon, uh, a polygon, by the way. I mean, the, 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 the battery is not really a polygon, but we can approximate it with a, with a polygon. And here is a mesh. Here is a finer mesh. And when we, when we do these things, then we can uh, basically do what, 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 we early, what, what we did earlier with the, the interpolation. Uh, what we can consider is again, the interpolation of uh, a function. The function we will consider here is sine pi x, sine pi y, and I just meshed a, a, a square, 0, 1 by 0, 1, uh, and, uh, well, here is a possible interpolation of that function. So I compute the value of the function at each point, at each node, at each point of each uh, uh, vertex uh, of a triangle, and then I will, um, I, 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 in between two, two in, in, in each triangle, I mean, uh, what I will do is I will consider a polynomial of degree one. So that will be a, polyno a, pol a polynomial that will uh, depend on x and y. So it's somehow it will be ax plus by plus c. And I will basically uh, consider this polynomial and approximate based on the values that I have in my notes. So what I did here is an interpolation of the function uh, sine pi x, sine pi y, based on this mesh. And of course, this is for, seven, for 16 degrees of freedom. Uh, I could basically, so J, JVD is 16, but I could increase that number. Here is 64, so obviously my mesh will be finer. And as you can see, the approximation of my function will be better. And I can keep going this way. I can actually replace 64 by 1024. So the mesh is really fine now, and the approximation is, is obviously much, much better. And I can keep going this way. Actually, here is a, is a pretty, pretty big number of degrees of freedom. Um, and obviously, the approximation, you, can, you cannot even see uh, the, with your naked eye uh, the difference between the function and its interpolation uh, with uh, you know, this mesh. All right, now let's consider the general case RD, any dimension. So uh, we'll consider again a domain which is bounded with a boundary that will be a, uh, which will be polyhedral. Now, 
uh, we will basically generalize what we did in dimension two, and we will replace triangles by simplices. Uh, and here is the definition for the triangulation of omega. So you consider JE simplices. So really, a simplex uh, will be uh, replacing the, the, the triangles, but it's just higher dimension, right? So what we will require is uh, each simplex to be included in the closure of omega. We will also uh, impose the union of these simplices to be omega, or actually closure of omega. And we will require the non-overlapping property, which in dimension D means that the intersection of two elements, two simplices, will either be empty or a simplex of a dimension which is smaller than D minus one. So think about it as, for instance, dimension three. In dimension three, you will have your uh, three-dimensional simplices, and they can either not meet, I mean, they can have an empty intersection, or they can meet on, on one of the, uh, at one point, or they can meet on one line, one edge, or they can meet on one face. But they cannot overlap in the sense that uh, one would get into the other, if you prefer. Okay, so uh, these um, will, I mean, the, the, the vertices of the, of the triangles, or actually the, the simplices, will be called nodes. Now, this is uh, the way we mesh uh, domains. And as I said, one interesting thing about meshing is that we have a domain omega, which obviously has uh, an infinite number of points. And now with the mesh, we're going to look at what happens at each node. And this is what we're going to do in the next video when we're going to discuss the internal approximation.